John Hope Franklin was a trailblazer in the field of United States history. The question of what ought to be included or omitted from textbooks, particularly history textbooks, is as old as the institution of formal education in the United States. John Hope Franklin found his mission in life to be this, to be certain that United States history included all people in the United States, particularly the history of African Americans. Well, many of my poems have been about the problems of working people trying to get ahead in the world, working people, both white and Negro, the problems of trying to educate your children when you don't have very much money. It's a poem called Mother to Son. Well, son, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tax in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor there. But all the time I'd been a-climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So, boy, don't you turn back. Don't you set on on the steps because you find it's kind of hard. Don't you fall now, for I still going, honey. I still climbing. And life for me ain't been no crystal stair. He was a chronicler, yes, but also a witness and participant in some of the most significant chapters of U.S. history in the 20th century. Born in Oklahoma in 1915, he was six years old when the Tulsa Race Massacre occurred. His father was present during the conflagration, and Buck Franklin's first-person typewritten account was discovered in 2015. and as I reached the sidewalk, a shrill whistle sounded from the direction of Standpipe Hill. And then, immediately thereafter, 5,000 feet, it seemed, were heard descending that hill in my direction. On they rushed, whooping to the top of their voices like so many cowboys and firing their guns at every step they took. I quickened my pace and, cutting across vacant lots and dodging behind buildings, I finally reached, I reached my office in safety, but I knew that the safety would be short-lived. I now knew the mob spirit. I knew, too, that government and law and order had broken down. I knew that mob law had been substituted in all its fiendishness and barbarity. From my office window, I could see planes circling in midair. They grew in number and hummed, darted, and dipped low. I could hear something like hail falling upon the top of my office building. Down East Archer, I saw the old Midway Hotel on fire, burning from its top, and then another and another and another building began to burn from the top. What, an attack from the air, too? I thought he's loving me. He's leaving all the time. In the 1930s at Fisk University in Nashville, where today one will find the John Hope and Aurelia E. Franklin Library, he was inspired by being surrounded by other ambitious academics. While enrolled, he also had to steel himself against a growing number of racist incidents and indignities that befell him and his acquaintances throughout the Jim Crow South. But encouraged by a mentor at Fisk, he applied to Harvard University for graduate studies. The second half of the 1930s saw John Hope at Harvard, minus a year back at Fisk, this time as a teacher. Though Harvard was not the escape from racist behavior he had known in the South, there were differences. He was not ever offered a chance to teach while there, for example. And he also saw bigotry from the objective point of view in the form of anti-Semitism on campus. At Harvard, Franklin worked his way through his doctorate, which included an opportunity to conduct research in North Carolina in Raleigh. When he arrived at the North Carolina State Archives in 1939 to conduct research for his Harvard doctoral dissertation, he had to wait three days for a separate room to be prepared to segregate him from white scholars who were working there. 
All of these experiences, personal and scholarly, led him to his crowning achievement, the publication of his textbook, From Slavery to Freedom, which was first published in 1947. The impact of From Slavery to Freedom cannot be overstated. It is now in its ninth edition, has been continually published since its debut, and has carved its place into history departments across the country and beyond. It has challenged the notion that the study of our history can be complete without including African American experiences and voices from every step of the way. It is not rewriting history, and in a sense, it's not even African American history. It is American history, and he includes Americans who were dismissed in previous iterations of historical study. He says himself, I thought of it from the outset as a corrective or as a supplementary revision of United States history. His intention was to use the historical record to reveal America to itself, to everybody, and for those who wish to know and learn to be grounded in facts and evidence. In another example of the historian being part of history, in 1953, while teaching at Howard University, he was recruited by Thurgood Marshall to be on the team that assembled the argument that struck down segregation in schools in the landmark 1954 Supreme Court case, Brown v. Board of Education. I was teaching in the summer of, uh, in the summer of 1953. I was teaching at Cornell University, on one of my <laughs> summer school stints, when I got a call from Thurgood Marshall asking me what I was going to be doing in the fall. I said, well, I'm going back to Howard University. He said, well, you know what else you're going to be doing? I said, no, what? He said, you're going to be working for me. And you're going to be uh, working on the historical aspects of this case. Questions having to do with the intent of the framers of the 13th Amendment, intent of the framers of, of the Constitution and so forth, regarding segregation and segregation in the schools. and he wanted me and a group of other historians and political scientists to study the primary sources of that period to see the extent to which we could argue that it was the intent, or not the intent, of the framers of the Constitution of the 13th Amendment, uh, 14th Amendment, and so forth, to uh, outlaw segregation in the schools. Uh, I would teach my courses on the first three days of the week and go to New York the last three days of the week and come back on Sunday to, to Washington to teach the following three days. In 1965, after Bloody Sunday at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, John Hope responded to a call for historians to join the march to Montgomery from March 21st to 25th. He recalls in his autobiography, we had no banner indicating that we were historians, and our modesty precluded our pro proclaiming who we were. Nevertheless, as we were lining up, someone produced the side of a corrugated box on which was painted in crude lettering, U.S. Historians. When by virtue of that impromptu sign, someone recognized us as being historians, the order came down that since this was a historic event, we should be given a prominent place so that we could bear witness to the events about which historians would someday write. Franklin's career took him all over the world through the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. He was involved with organizations and universities seemingly everywhere, from Brooklyn College to Cambridge to the University of Chicago to Duke. He served on historical boards and commissions like the Fulbright Board of Foreign Scholars, serving as its chair from 1966 to 1969. He contributed essays and lectures on the Centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1963 and on the Bicentennial of the Declaration of Independence in 1976. In 1980, President Carter appointed him to be a delegate to the UNESCO Conference in Belgrade. His name graces institutions and libraries and museums. He received over 200 awards and honorary degrees, including, in 1995, the nation's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And shortly thereafter, John Hope was appointed to lead the advisory board for the President's Initiative on Race, intended to spark a nationwide discussion on racial matters. John Hope Franklin's contributions to the nation are stunning and humbling. He is and will remain a teacher in so many ways and for a long time to come. 
On the occasion of his 80th birthday, he remarked, Regardless, a particular age I conceded does not bring any special gift, prescience, or wisdom. Whether one is 40 or 80, the magic is in the transforming power to see and understand, to give evidence of mature thought and reflection, which in turn flows from emotional, psychological, and intellectual maturity. Today I am honored to have the chance to talk with veteran UNCG history professor Dr. Lauren Schwenninger. He was mentored by Dr. John Hope Franklin. He then became his research assistant and proceeded to co-author at least two books with him, along the way becoming lifelong friends. Dr. Schwenninger has contributed greatly to the historical record as well, collecting and organizing and archiving slave records in the United States. He joins us now to share some thoughts and remembrances of John Hope Franklin. Much has been written and said about Professor Franklin's involvement in the nation's struggle for equal rights. Having experienced racial segregation in his native Oklahoma, as well as as a student at Harvard University and in the North and the South, he felt strongly about seeking correct to correct injustices done to African Americans. In 1949, he assisted Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund in preparing background information on the case of Lyman Johnson versus the University of Kentucky involving the separate but equal clause in, the, in, in a decision by the United States Supreme Court in Plessy versus Ferguson, which happened 53 years before. In his analysis, Franklin compared the two institutions, showing how such an assertion based on race rather than any objective comparison was erroneous. In the summer of 1953, following the Supreme Court deferred judgment of five cases challenging racial segregation in elementary and high schools, Franklin again assisted Marshall in preparing historical background information for this case. Now he prepared a monograph, as he called it, uh, in, in which he showed how Americans defied and ignored and worked against every conception of equality laid down by the 14th Amendment and subsequent legislation. It was used by the NACP Legal Defense Fund in the la landmark 1954 Brown versus Topeka Board of Education, uh, ending segregation in public schools. As the civil rights movement expanded, Franklin demonstrated his support in several ways, including participating with Martin Luther King Jr. in the march from Selma to Montgomery. Then later he focused some of his historical subjects uh, that related directly to equal rights. In 1974, for example, he wrote a prologue article, The Enforcement of Civil Rights Act, and in it he noted how uh, they were, the civil rights acts were not enforced or, or indeed enforceable. In 1976, he delivered the Jefferson Lectures later published as racial equality in America. In 1987, along with several other lawyers, several other scholars and lawyers, he testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee arguing against the nomination of, of uh, uh, Robert Bork to the United States Supreme Court. Bork had been an attorney general of the United States and uh, had published uh, a, a good deal about the law. Despite the nominee's intelligence, Franklin said Bork remained steadfastly opposed to civil rights. And lastly, in 1997, Franklin reluctantly, he was 82 at the time, accepted an invitation to chair President Clinton's initial a racial initiative advisory board working tirelessly in that capacity. 
In short, when asked to do so, he lent his considerable talents and energy to solving racial problems. At the same time, he always emphasized that there was a significant difference between scholarship and advocacy. Mm -hmm. Yet if someone were to ask Professor Franklin what he considered his most important legacy, he would undoubtedly say his work as a historian, a scholar, and a teacher. Uh, his legacy as a historian and scholar can be seen in numerous books, articles, essays, and other writings, a total of 20 some books that he published, and the ninth edition of From Slavery to Freedom, A History of African Americans, which has sold more than 3.5 million copies and has been translated into five languages. In March 1946, Franklin accepted an offer from Knopf to write this book. As he did, he kept several goals paramount. He would put history of African Americans in a broad context, a context that included uh, African history, South American history, Caribbean history, and North American history. He would use the most up-to-date political, economic, and social and cultural studies to to substantiate his arguments. And he would show how to understand American history. It was necessary to re recognize the importance of race and slavery and segregation and what W.B. Du Bois said uh, was the two-ness among black Americans. And lastly, he would write, as he said, to be read in jargon-free straightforward prose. On the day it was published, 22nd of October, of September, 1947, John Hope was 32. So his legacy as a teacher was e equally exceptional with literally thousands of students uh, in over many years in many colleges and universities. Besides his faculty status at various institutions, he spent the uh, summer uh, work, uh, teaching in uh, various places, and he spent a whole year at, at uh, Cambridge University, uh, among other colleges and universities, California Ber Berkeley, University of Wisconsin, Harvard. As a teacher, he was generous with his time, positive, encouraging, demanding, and rigorous. His lectures were electric. His seminars were inspiring. He responded to questions with lengthy, well-organized, and sometimes uh, punctuated with quotes and summaries of various arguments among historians. He always had time for his Chicago graduate students. He read and corrected numerous versions of their papers and chapters and dissertations and turned many of them into articles and books or helped to do that. Not only did he keep up with his former students over the years, but he joined with them in editing, rewriting and author and co-authoring various books. Franklin followed each of their careers with greatest interest and often intervened to assist them as they rose through the ranks or moved from one institution to another. During his scholarly and teaching careers and afterwards, he remained a person of warmth, compassion, intellectual vigor, and intense personal loyalty. His death on March 25th, 2009 at the age of 94 it's a great loss to the historical profession as well as to the nation. What do you think is the maybe a principal thing or the main thing that we should we should take away from the life and the legacy of Dr. John Hope Franklin? Uh, that he wrote and that he uh, wrote clearly and uh, and was one of the uh, 
terrific uh, writers of the African American experience to talk talk about all the complexities of it mm -hmm. and uh, the difficulties of it, mm -hmm. and he he kept on a, a very sensible uh, and uh, kind of uh, powerful uh, summary of it over the decades. Mm 